China's agenda uh, here is not limited to Ukraine, but Ukraine is an important component of a larger Chinese agenda uh, of helping to establish the framework of a new world order. And to the extent that China can contribute to this world order, and I would say through contributing to a, a peace a settlement in Ukraine, it of course benefits greatly. No other country benefits as much from uh, peace in Ukraine, except of course the Ukrainians, <laughs> uh, than China does in my opinion. And the people who suffer, who, who, who want peace least are of course Britain, NATO and the United States because they see nothing good in a peace for Ukraine, uh, which undermines their uh, agenda for a long-term military buildup uh, of the West over a decade or more, and undermine, would undermine the rationale for that. Right. And I think that's that's a good segue into talking about peace negotiations, because, yeah. you know, the big difference between the carnage we are seeing in Ukraine and the carnage we are seeing in Gaza is that the one in Ukraine is definitely, you know, this is this classical and 19th century war about uh, political aims as yeah. it can get in the 21st century. It has been in one Ukraine. from the beginning. Clausewitzian war. <laughs> the Clausewitzian war is like extension of politics by other means, right? But this means that the the settlement will be one, it will be a political one, like one way or another. Um, so if the strategy of Russia now is to put as much pressure as possible in order to gain a buffer zone that the Ukraine can use as a negotiating chip, it presumes that there will be negotiations. So, and we see we see this from both sides. Like the Russians, Vladimir Putin has said time and again, we need to do, we need to negotiate. And the the, the West says uh, we need a peace process, and they are setting up this this peace summit in Switzerland, which I think is. Is more of a of a, of a show, but I talked to Balash Orban, the political advisor of Hungary, the other day, and he said Hungary supports this because we support any process that yeah. might lead toward pe uh, real peace negotiations, and this might be one. Um, and it is, and it's good that nations like Hungary, and they won't be alone. I, I'm I, I don't know if China's going or not. The last I've heard, it's unlikely that they will be there, but. <clears throat> Um, there are many uh, skeptics of, of the Ukrainian approach, uh, which is to argue that uh, <clears throat> the entire world should unite around Zelensky's peace plan, which demands the withdrawal of Russian forces and, sur and Russia's surrender to Ukraine. And that's, that's the only thing worth negotiating. I think the presence of uh, nations like Hungary brings <clears throat> will bring uh, a bit of realism to uh, the proceedings, which will otherwise not come to any agreement. So the situation for Ukraine is not a very happy one in going into these uh, negotiations in Geneva, because <clears throat> if they do not make concessions that would create more realistic terms as as nations like Hungary understand it then there will be no peace uh, summit they, they, not, they will have a large number of countries not signing on to the final declaration and this will be seen <coughs> as a defeat for Ukrainian a failure for Ukrainian uh, diplomacy. Um, a more hopeful scenario is that um, given the composition of, of nations which uh, tends to heavily favor the Ukrainian peace plan, but not only those nations, uh, the dissident nations can add a certain amount of reality, certain points to the final draft 
which would which, which might serve uh, as an opening to Russia. Uh, that, that would be the, the most beneficial outcome, I think, uh, of this. And if everyone more or less is on board with this, including some of the skeptics, then Zelensky can still go home and say, we our, our diplomacy was victorious because look at how many people supported the overall project. <clears throat> and the next step would be um, starting some sort of negotiations with Russia. It's this intermediate period between uh, the what Ukraine wants and what Russia is willing to discuss uh, that we don't have a much connectivity there. We don't have a clear sense of who could act as an intermediary. Although, to be fair, many people have talked about China. Hmm. And but but China uh, is as much in Russia's corner on this as frankly the United States is in is in Ukraine's corner. Uh, Russia, I'm sorry, Ukraine, um, Ukraine. I'm sorry. China's agenda uh, here is not limited to Ukraine, but Ukraine is an important component of a larger Chinese agenda uh, of helping to establish the framework of a new world order. And to the extent that China can contribute to this world order, and I would say through contributing to a, a peace a settlement in Ukraine, it of course benefits greatly. No other country benefits as much from uh, peace in Ukraine except of course the ukrainians <laughs> uh than china does in my opinion and the people who suffer who, who, who want peace least are of course britain nato and the united states because they see nothing good in uh, peace for ukraine uh, which undermines their uh agenda for a long-term military buildup. Uh, of the West over a decade or more, and undermine would undermine the rationale for that, especially if out of this peace summit were to come some uh, vision of a new security architecture or peace conference <laughs> that would include Russia. Um, that that I think would be well. The, I'm sure the United States would want to throw cold water on that idea as much as it possibly could. Yeah, it may I not mean, be able to do so. I, I mean, yeah, if if China and, and with Russia and in the in the end with the with the agreement of Ukraine managed to pull off something like a conference for security and cooperation hosted in Beijing, Ooh. that would be huge. But we have seen China becoming more, let me call it assertive in like yeah. peacemaking because it's the one who brought together Iran and Saudi Arabia and on the BRICS <laughs> right. they tried to unite those you know they have this opposite strategy at the moment from divide and 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 rule but but rather let's 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 try to combine in 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 a framework uh, strategic opponents um right. and actually Russia said the 12 point plan by China was Welcome, one, and, yeah. and Ukraine actually said they didn't oppose it either because they have right. that relationship. So there <laughs> is an, an 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 avenue and an opening. The question I have is whether one thing I I, I, I seem to have understood is that um, Mr. Putin and and a lot of Russian uh, elites they think in terms of processes, um, like what what over the long term leads somewhere, um whether they have at the moment a process in mind that leads toward the outcome that they want to see or whether this is still all in the all in the dark i mean there must the, the, the political rationale behind these the military push in order to get to a negotiated settlement uh, what would you say is is that like is it the bargaining and, and then like forcing the americans to accept um an a negotiated well, end well i've argued uh, since the very beginning of the war, the first comment I made was seemed, seemed to me to be an obvious statement. 
um, there is really no incentive to negotiating for peace until it is clear to the sides involved in the conflict that the outcome is inevitable, that whatever resources are committed or likely to be committed, one side is clearly going to triumph in the end. And <clears throat> this realization, I think, has settled <clears throat> in, <clears throat> uh, in Russia. It has... It has been embraced by significant components of the Ukrainian elite, I would say. Um, and it is certainly understood by many military specialists in Europe, both close to government or recently retired, uh, as well as in the United States. But the problem that exists for the West is that there are elections, and in an election, you as a politician cannot back away from words and commitments that you've made very recently. It'll simply be brought up to you, and you will be portrayed as someone who either lied before or is making our country seem unreliable. And the rhetoric of the U.S. administration, Britain, France, and Germany, and NATO leaders has gone so far and is so open-ended that it is very difficult for them to find a viable diplomatic solution because they have excluded diplomacy from their strategic objective. The strategic objective is the defeat and punishment of Russia. Now, I've noticed that the EU spokesmen have resorted to outright lies. In other words, a, a recent EU uh, spokesman said that um, uh, a, there was a question from a journalist in the audience that said, well, Josep Borrell, the head of the EU, said that the objective of EU policy was the strategic defeat of Russia. And the EU spokesman uh, last week corrected him and said, no, that's not what we have, have said. That's not what he said. Uh, the EU is, a, is on a peace mission and we are supporting Ukraine in defensive efforts in order to maintain sovereignty and extend peace. Well, it takes no effort at all to go back and find Josep Borrell's actual statements and which promised the defeat of, of Russia. So uh, I don't know quite what's going on, but one of the ways that governments uh, weasel out of being in a position which seems them to leave them no options is to simply deny that they ever said that. Yeah, and but... then just, that'll be their new the new position. I never said that. I never meant to say that. And my new position is this, which of course doesn't lend to their credibility, but at least it gives them some way to say something different. And I think we'll be seeing more and more of of the of such statements directly contradicting what uh, previous statements were made. I, I have come to that conclusion too. So when, when you're saying that this credibility issue in democratic systems is, is, is an issue, then yes, to a certain extent. But we have seen time and again um, that the art of politics in the West is the art of controlling the current six weeks narrative. Yeah. Because anything older than that, people don't care and don't remember it. And that's a, especially during Corona, we have seen shameless, shameless, like inverting of previous statements and saying like, no, no, that was always our position. Our position always was that X is the case, even though then in the end they did Y and they said, no, no, Y was the case time and again. Right. And it didn't it didn't hurt them. It didn't hurt them. Uh, interestingly enough, right. um, the same 
not it's different for for other systems like China, where where China just says, okay, we change policy, period, and like dra dra uh, uh, radical changes um, in the cor Corona um, phase, oh. and and you know that's just what it was, and it and it went that route. So I do believe if 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 the political decision was taken in the West that now we have a different strategy, they would sell it as we've always had this this strategy. So the question is how to get there because. At the moment, right now, there's still a question of NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine, which would be a massive escalation, right? It seems as if though it's going against that. But we've had, this was, it's now four weeks or so that this was contemplated for real. So the question is, escalate further into direct conflict with Russia or actually accept the inevitable? Um, if I you don't, don't. Yeah, I, 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 I continue to think um, <clears throat> that... Uh, a massive visible escalation of NATO troops in frontline fighting capacities is unlikely. There's little doubt anymore that NATO advisors, NATO personnel exist throughout uh, the Ukrainian military and are offering guidance and training and targeting support and sharing intelligence. So it is to that extent a <clears throat> jointly directed war effort. But the numbers have to be kept fairly small because again, in the mind of many, I'll just speak for Americans, the idea of what we call boots on the ground in large numbers uh, suggests a, a totally different level of commitment. And I cannot imagine that even the Biden administration or any European administration would be so foolish in the period leading up to the American and other European uh, elections to risk sending troops that could easily be struck and hundreds could die. You know, we have Ukrainian troops dying in large numbers. These numbers aren't widely publicized, but uh, they are discussed on Telegram channels and by various sources, especially the Russian military. And there's rarely any denial of the numbers, of the scale of the numbers in Ukrainian sources. We can assume it's a very large number of troops dying. Now imagine a, a French unit or a German unit or a British unit that gets wiped out by a Russian missile overnight. I don't think that that can be hidden for very long. Uh, they, they won't advertise it, but once that happens, the actual cost of war will become apparent to voters who will have to vote in a matter of weeks on whether to continue this policy or not. And whatever you think, people are probably not going to vote in the United States for the presidential elections on the issue of Ukraine. It's a distant issue. Uh, we'll throw money at the problem. It'll go away. That tends to be the thinking. It's it's not like the Gaza uh uh, involvement of the United States, which involves many, uh, many political domestic forces in the United States who are fighting over control of that narrative. Uh, th there is no debate over the control of the narrative in Ukraine. It's all in favor of Ukraine. And uh, th the only reason that there was a holdup in the aid was because uh, president as presidential candidate Trump said he uh, did not support such aid, and uh, he, he wanted to see the war end as quickly as possible. And the first task, and this is a, a quote as I remember, the first task should be stopping the loss of life. Which I thought was a remarkably humanitarian and cogent thing to say uh, for him. Um, so um, I, I just can't believe that the uh, officials in the Biden administration would take that risk, the, the risk of sending 
NATO troops, U.S. troops uh, into uh, a, a conflict zone where they could potentially at any moment be wiped out. And I think uh, doing so would not be seen as a provocation by Russia. It, it, it simply couldn't be, it, it, it couldn't be sold that way because clearly the escalation would come from, uh, would be coming from the NATO and the US side in this case, in terms of sending troops. Yeah, that's why I'm worried that they might get the idea to just send a couple of, you know, Polish troops or so, you know, lower ranking NATO. <laughs> but OK, let's let's not go there. Let's suppose that this stops, because I would like the last couple of minutes to focus with you on this article that came out on April 16th uh, in Foreign Affairs, which surprised me and, and many others um, called the talks that could have ended the war in Ukraine, where Sergei Rachenko and Samuel uh, Karap or Charap uh, this Jarab, they discuss um the a memo that they had like draft the draft of the Istanbul like peace agreement that yeah. that they were working towards and the the question that I have is or, or the the reason why I think this is important is a um foreign affairs tends to be extremely hawkish I dislike them very very much so reading something like that in foreign affairs. Um, which actually then says, the, the conclusion is, they came very far, and the Russians actually gave in. They gave a lot and much more to Ukraine, I mean, which we also know from Ukrainian sources, so this is not really new, but um, this is now, this has been published, and um, I still wonder why Vladimir Putin still didn't didn't publish these drafts, because he says he has them, but he didn't publish them, and this tells <laughs> me that there, he still believes to a certain extent that what was the, the basis that was created back there could be taken forward, even in different forms, and, and of course with current battlefield realities, which the Russians keep saying over and over, but that there's still a blueprint that one can go back to in order to arrive at a political settlement. Now, what was your reading of, 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 of this Istanbul yeah. process? Well, I've been, re I've been collecting a lot of information. <clears throat> I believe, um, hmm, I forget if it was Financial Times or Wall Street Journal, maybe the Wall Street Journal, uh, published what it claimed were the accords. Die Welt also published a version of the, that it said were the accords. Um, the versions that have been published are less than 20 pages, which is not enough uh, for the kind of details that were discussed uh, or have been talked about as being in the agreement. So what we are <clears throat> talking, what we are discussing uh, in all these instances of here are the Minsk Accords, is actually the framework. And the framework is a simple one <clears throat> and therefore an interesting one, which is Ukraine becomes in perpetuity a neutral country <clears throat> in exchange for Western guarantees for its security that Russia also recognizes as valid, or maybe joins somehow. It's not clear <clears throat> what the relationship between the mutual security agreements would be. This could be nicely tied together, these mutual security uh, arrangements, on behalf <clears throat> of Ukrainian sovereignty in the context of a pan-European security conference where all of the sides come together and just as in the original CSCE uh, process <clears throat> in Helsinki, they agree to respect each other's internal affairs and territorial boundaries. No, no changes to the existing territorial boundaries. I remember growing up in Germany, all the atlases had uh, uh, unter uh, temporan unter polnische oder sowjetische Verwaltung mm. for, for Eastern uh, Prussia. And that disappeared after that. But until then, it was the law. <laughs> you know, so all the German textbooks 
and um, and Atlas has had to reflect that. So that would be a nice way to resolve that issue. In that context, one <clears throat> could at least uh, think about throwing in a number of carrots to stabilize the relationship between Ukraine, Russia, and Europe, um, which might, for example, include things like holding referenda in 20, 25 years or so in uh, <clears throat> regions uh, now under Soviet control over Russia. whether they would like to be continue to be part of Russia, be part of Ukraine, be independent. I don't know what the options are, but <clears throat> that's, that I've suggested before with my um, colleague Gil Doctorow that uh, projecting these kind of referenda onto the next gen, let the next generation deal with it, um, <clears throat> would certainly allow enough time for uh, healing and reconstruction, the two of which go together to, to begin. We also have to, in this context, and I think this would have to be, again, only addressed in the context of some larger <clears throat> security and peace framework, address the issue of sanctions, which has become a major international headache. Everybody is sanctioning everybody. It's like it's like a gunfight in the old west, where everyone starts shooting and then figures out, you know, they don't even know who they're shooting or why, or, or what the casualties will be. This is the way sanctions has come to be viewed uh, by many in the world, and the the country that suffers the most from that, well, of course, is Europe because of its dependence on the United States, but the United States also indirectly because the United States imposes these sanctions, uh, demands uh, adherence to third-party sanctions uh, through its Western allies, imposes the, the burden of these sanctions on, the, on Europeans, but then it doesn't escape the cost itself because it then has to support uh, the Western European, or not just Western European, but European economies in general to some extent, or they're not likely to continue to be as supportive of these sanctions. Anyway, it's it's a complete headache. No one honestly now understands the ramifications. No one understands how sanctions work. No one understands how sanction regimes work. It's a huge industry that feeds on itself and multiplies. Um, we should return to the principles of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations Charter, which explicitly prohibits sanctions as a, as a weapon of, of, of political influence and, uh, uh, and really at, at some point need to deal with this because it's becoming an impossible issue that is, that is damaging all of international life, political, cultural, social, educational. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's, the sanction questions reminds me very much of the movie Jurassic Park, where mm. the scientist at one point says, life always finds a way. And yeah. the same is true for trade. Trade always finds a way. We it just does. need to keep in mind that Gaza is the most bombed territory on Earth for like, I don't know, for, for decades. The most sanctioned place, the most controlled place, and weapons still find their way in there. Hamas is is still able to to get its hands on ammunition. So the question is whether you whether you call it trade or whether you call it smuggling. But that's the only question. It will yeah. happen anyhow, and we see that with Russia right now. Exactly, and Russia and Iran for twenty years, and Korea. You know, there is no way to successfully uh, impose a sanctions regime. But again, it's the same problem as uh, moving away from your verbal commitments. Uh, as Western politicians, and not only Western politicians, but, but it's peculiar 
uh, it's exaggerated, I would say, among Western politicians. They make political statements as, as if they were moral dicta, as if, as if they were proclamations from God himself. And as a result, they then have nowhere to turn to say, well, you know, uh, in reality, we can't do this. Or we tried this but failed, but I guess we have to continue to fail because we can't, you know, change our dogma on this. We have to somehow escape this, um, this vicious circle where bad policies uh, are created by people who are committed to uh, extreme moralizing uh, and, and therefore cannot uh, ever acknowledge uh, that they might have made uh, a mistake. And the classic example, just take any statement uh, made in the past years or months or weeks by Senator Lindsey Graham. At some point, he is, he's now gotten to the point of advocating uh, uh, nu nuking Iran uh, because it uh, ostensibly uh, supports uh, Hamas. Uh, and if, I mean, even even the Israeli government doesn't go that far. No one goes that far, and yet uh, he is not the least important senator in uh, in influence. And these are the kind of people who we see on television every day, and they they cloud our mind with nonsense, preventing us from from seeing the reality as it is and and acting upon it. But very dangerous, very dangerous uh, uh, nonsense, because if the nonsense is believed, the nonsense can become policy. Um, but we, I think we have to leave it at that. Uh, Nikolai Petro, um, thank you very much for your time. Everybody check out Nikolai's book, The Tragedy of Ukraine. And um, can people follow you on Twitter and, and other channels? Not, not, not Twitter, but I do have a, um, a website. Everything I post, including commentary, <clears throat> is on my website, which is npetro.net. npetro.net it is, everybody. Nikolai, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night.